normally I would introduce them, but I don't think that uh, Jack or Bill Bernstein needs any introduction, and we don't want to steal the time from their conversation. So at this point, uh, uh, we well, this is a free ranging, except non political uh, exchange. When we break that rule, <laughs> <laughs> don't do that to me again. So you got me in a lot of trouble. Right? So, anyway, uh, this is called Fireside Chat, and uh, uh, you guys hang at it. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, Jack, I want to start uh, by asking you a question that everyone wants to know. Uh, which is, what does the retirement mean? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. What does the retirement of Gus mean uh, to those of us who invest in uh, his index portfolios? Well, first place, he's been a great guy, a fabulous friend, terrific mathematician. Certainly one of Vanguard's priceless assets. But think about what he's doing. He's matching the market. And that is not complex beyond belief. There are lots of nuances in it, but if you follow the performance of all of, let's say, for the purpose of the argument here, uh, S&P 500 index funds, they are all the same uh, when you adjust for, for uh, expense ratio. Their net returns are identical. Of course, everybody has picked up how to do this. Heck, it may be that Gus taught them all. But I wouldn't spend 30 seconds worrying about what happens next. Uh, and, uh, you know, an index fund is an index fund. And one of the great things about it is that when you buy an index fund, you're really investing for life without worrying about who the manager is. I mean, think about this for a minute. Uh, first, your life is measured over a span of, say, 50 years, whatever it may be. Some of us may not have quite that many yet left, but uh, there we are. But over, over a lifetime, how many managers are going to be there for a lifetime? And the answer is none. Uh, they're going to come and they're going to go. Uh, and funds come and go. And individual mutual funds come and go. The failure rate is about 50% every 10 years. To worry about that in an index fund. In regular funds, managers change every five years. So over, say, 25 years, I think I'm about right on the math here, uh, if you own four mutual funds, you have 20 managers in 25 years, roughly a manager a year. What is the possibility uh, that 20 managers, a manager a year, can beat the index? It's zero. It's very close to zero. Maybe it's 100 to 1%. So all the index fund has to do is match the index. It's become a commodity. And for all Gus's fabulous contributions to Vanguard, you know, he was the like to say that he likes to say, and I like to say, uh, I was the architect and I picked a great builder. And that's the truth of the matter. Uh, but uh, his retirement will not doesn't trouble anybody in this room, and it certainly doesn't trouble me, except as a friend. Yeah, I mean, I, I should mention that, you know, just to amplify a point that Jack made, it was always something that I had wondered about, that we all know that, you know, over the long run, the odds of beating an index fund are 20%, which would be not horrible. Uh, but that the odds of you're putting together a portfolio of active managers that would be an indexed approach is much smaller uh, than that. And Alan Roth finally did that study, an excellent study, and demonstrated exactly what uh, Jack said, uh, which is that you know, you're know you in the 1% range when you're putting together a portfolio of active uh, managers. Do you have any comments, Jack, on the, the switching away from the MSCI indexes, do you think that's has any significance at all? Uh, no, that's a kind of funny thing. It was a closely guarded secret that we were thinking about doing this in Vanguard. And uh, while I have lots of contacts there and in touch with a lot of people, a closely guarded secret is something they shouldn't tell me about. And they didn't, and they shouldn't. And then I looked and then the secret comes out in the paper. And my first reaction was to yawn. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The idea that, say, an MSCI 500, if they have one, or a Russell 500, or a Vanguard 500, or a Dow Jones total stock market, all of them, old, old Wilshire 5000, and there are probably half a dozen other indexes at that like 500 level or total stock market level. 
And they're all going to have the same return over the long run, no matter which, which firm is managing. Because large cap stocks are large cap stocks. The correlations are between managers of index portfolios in that area is going to be 100. And uh, later on, I'll, I'll show you a chart showing, uh, it, and it's, it's sort of relevant here, but I don't want to get into it until I have the chart. But uh, the idea, my idea has always been on for everything we do, including active management. I used to call it uh, relative predictability. I would call it relative predictability. And now in this modern age of quants, uh, we want to have my R squares. But there's no change except you can understand what relative predictability means. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting issue. I think it does matter a little bit, maybe at the basis point uh, range. Uh, you know, I'd rather be indexing an obscure index, large cap index in the S&P 500, just from the point of view of the constitution and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, expenses. I mean, I'm much happier with the large cap index fund than I am with the index trust 500 fund. Uh, if I want to index that particular area. Jack, let me ask you. Yeah, actually, let me let me basically agree with you, and that is, I was making this point to talk about total stock market index funds, total international funds, uh, all with a very heavy large cap bias. There, there could easily be differences between the S and P. What is it, the 400 or something down there, whatever the small cap index, 600 for the small cap index, and the Russell. They have different ways of reconstituting. Some are better and worse. We try to get around like a lot of that by using different indexers, but as a broad generalization, and when you can save as much as we are saving, I don't know the exact number, but it's significant. These guys get away with murder for calculating. I mean, you saw the stock of MSCI, why an index provider is publicly held is another good question, but um, their stock dropped 33% or something the day we made this announcement. We saved money, they lost money, and uh, so hats off to Vanguard, we're doing what we, you know, eating what we, what do we say, eating what we preach or something, eating what we cook. Uh, and uh, so, but it, it doesn't, it, I think you do have to be, I think, agree with Bill here, you have to be a little more careful, if not a lot more careful, in the lower areas. But a firm like Vanguard or another big indexer like Fidelity or uh, BlackRock is going to be, you know, very much uh, able, to, able to do these things in the right way. And if they aren't, Time will emerge and tell them that, and they'll have to change. So uh, it's, uh, I, I made, I've never done this before, I made too, too grand a generalization. Well, maybe, maybe almost never. Almost <laughs> never. Uh, that segues, Jack, into another question that I have, and this is sort of a personal interest of mine, and I, I, I you know, apologize for indulging in front of this audience, uh, but it's, it's a very interesting issue. I mean, Vanguard is a nonprofit. Uh, and it's a nonprofit which is slowly gaining market share on those companies that uh, supposedly should be benefiting from the invisible hand. And it's not the only area in our society in which nonprofits outpace uh, uh, the for profit sector. I'd much rather be in a hospital, for example, that's run by a nonprofit than one that's run by the HC in Nevada. I'd rather, you know, how many, how many great for profit universities can you mention? Uh, you know, University of Phoenix is the biggest one. I don't think it has the best reputation in this country. Uh, and, and so there are some areas uh, that the hidden hand doesn't do as well as the nonprofit. And you've written, of course, about performance of mutual funds depending upon their corporate structure and their corporate ownership. I'm wondering if you have any reflections on that. Well, let's look at it this way. Uh, the one thing that distinguishes the mutual fund industry from other industries is the relationship between cost and return dollar for dollar. In other words, you would not necessarily that cost determines return, but if you get return X and deduct 20 basis points from it or 10, uh, you're going to have a, lot, a big advantage on someone who provides the exact same performance and charges the exact same kind of fund and charges 100 or 200 basis points. There's no way around the man. Uh, so as long as gross return in the markets or in your fund minus cost equals net return, whoever has the lowest cost has the highest return. This is not complicated. And our industry is just finally trying to catch up with it. And they don't know how to. Uh, and the, the, 
problem is, is a very simple one. They are in business to make money for themselves or to make money for the financial conglomerates that own the management company. And for those of you who have read my book with great care, uh, if, if these aren't the numbers that are in the book, forgive me. Uh, but uh, of the 50 largest mutual fund management companies, uh, around 36, I believe, are owned by great big financial conglomerates, so like Canada, right down the line, Deutsche Bank, uh, and so on. And they, those companies have bought mutual fund firms uh, to, to earn a return on their capital, their corporate capital of, say, Deutsche Bank. And the interest of the shareholders in that fund is to earn a return on their capital. And those, that's a conflict of interest right there. Uh, when you're in business to make money for yourself, and the people that you're investing for think you're in business to make money for them. And so that they have a great difficulty in competing. Another six or seven firms in this industry are publicly held, uh, just there's their own stockholders around. And so I think that leaves about six firms that are privately held, six big firms, which of course would be Fidelity, uh, Capital Group, out in, uh, California American Funds, and Dodge and Cox. Uh, there aren't a lot of them. And then Vanguard, which is sort of uh, privately held by its own shareholders, if you want to look at it that way. So that's the, we have a, we have a tremendous advantage because this business not only is cost everything, but cost can be measured with precision. I mean, if somebody else's, I don't know, Lincoln Continental uh, is more valuable than somebody else's Mercedes Benz or Jaguar, uh, all that benefit is in the mind, in style. Maybe a little bit in construction, but whatever it is. Diamonds, they may be a girl's best friend, uh, but it's very hard to measure precise value. But in this business, you can do it, you can do the math, you can see the math, and see just where it comes out. You do have to estimate things like turnover costs. Uh, we always ignore sales commissions, which is still a very big part, sales is a big part of this. And Vanguard has, you know, because of our structure and the kind of funds we, we choose to run, we have very low portfolio turnover, the cost of that is essentially zero. We have no sales loads. So when you compare our, say, 18, 20 basis point overall B, sometimes as low as five basis points, with others who are on average in this industry to call it 100 basis points for fun. You just have this huge advantage, but they can't compete. The example I use is, if I can just rattle on for one more minute here, is that, uh, so we're up in Fidelity, and there's Ned Johnson. And he says, Vanguard is eating our lunch. Do something about it. Get everybody in the room and say, what are we going to do? Vanguard is eating our lunch. Eating on lunch. <laughs> So they all come back about a week later and said, we got it. Uh, we can get the expense ratio down by eliminating your profits. I'm not sure that's going to make the guy happy. <laughs> Cutting out the marketing budget. No more green lines running across your television screen. <laughs> Becoming much more efficient. Uh, taking big, big bonuses away from managers who don't perform. And I think if we do all these things, no marketing, uh, no profits, uh, much more efficient on the investment side and on the administrative side. Uh, negotiate with the custodians, the whole works. We can get down to 50 basis points. Mm -hmm. And I won't try to emulate Mr. Johnson's accent here. <laughs> he says, 50 basis points? Why will be? 250% higher than Vanguard. <laughs> Why do we do that? So what is his option? He cannot do that. He will not do that. People don't like to cut their own throats, right? And, uh, so he's going to keep milking that cash cow, which will probably last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and you know, that, that is the most, without any, any measure at all, the most intelligent business decision he could possibly make. He's doing the right thing from his personal standpoint, from the standpoint of that firm. Uh, so he's, he, if, he, if he was doing it as a fiduciary and not a businessman, he would do just the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a problem Vanguard has that we've gotten such scale now, two trillion dollars, oh my god, OMG. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, no one can get to our scale. So it's someone operating exactly the way we do. 
which is really impossible because no one's going to be pretty close to 95% index. I'll talk about that later. Um, so you've got to pay the money manager something. But if you just paid them on performance, paid the firm on performance, that would be a good thing for the clients, but a bad thing for the manager. But you could probably get to, let me say you get to 40 basis points. Uh, so what? As a wise man named Abraham Lincoln once said, the world's a little note or long remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the interesting, it's interesting you brought up uh, Ned, Ned Johnson to a wonderful long accent, by the way. <laughs> uh, what it is that Ned Johnson will do what is in Fidelity's long-term best interest, and he may be able to play it out for decades ahead to determine his, his heirs and heiresses. Uh, but that's still a better case scenario than what you've also written about, which is what happens to publicly traded companies, where they are managing next quarter's profits, which is a recipe for, for disaster. And there's also a moral angle to some I, I think it's worth, you're probably not going to toot your own horn on this. People become second grade teachers and Marines and join the diplomatic corps, not for the money. They do it for moral reasons. They think the world will serve a useful purpose. And I think that the people at Vanguard go to work in the morning and realize that they are serving a socially useful purpose. You saw that tradition, of course. You saw it as a useful social uh, enterprise. And I think you certainly inculcated that, that corporate culture. Just about everybody who works at Vanguard could be working for somewhere else for a lot more money. You uh, say it isn't so. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> you didn't have two. You didn't have one helicopter, but only two helicopters, as I think someone pointed out. Uh, and 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 I think that's the issue: is why why are you why are you doing this? And I think the people who work at the big Wall Street firms are in it for the bucks, and the people who work at Vanguard are in it because they want to be able to look at themselves. In, uh, in, in the mirror. And I think there's some activities that are socially useful. I think providing you know, expensive investment products, uh, safe investment products is one of them. Uh, but making widgets is not. I mean, you're not going to get non profit car companies. You need the municipal hand to, uh, to make those. Um, yeah, well, alternatives. Uh, David Swenson's had a rough five years of it. Uh, and, not bad, just yeah, not great. Just, yeah, not bad, just not just not great. Uh, uh, do you think that he? Do you think? You know, why do you think that has happened? Do you think this the, the ground has just gotten too covered? Do you think that uh, uh, he has a different approach? I'm obviously no longer he's very ill right now, but do you think it's possible to sustain that sort of performance? Well, I never believed he could sustain that kind of performance. And I said that to David, who was a great, great human being. I mean, you just, a straight arrow. I mean, there's nobody any better as a, as a human being in the combined money man. He's, he's just a wonderful guy, even though he went to Yale. He <laughs> <laughs> only run Yale. I guess he didn't go there. And uh, so I have great respect for him. But I said, how can you go on like this in the future? And he said, Jack, you'd be amazed how many stupid investors there are out there. <laughs> and uh, I think there are probably fewer than expected, Bill. Fewer than expected. But uh, there is the advantages these university endowments funds have is no conflicts of interest, uh, infinite time horizons, no worry about a massive redemptions, and no daily reporting, weekly reporting, monthly reporting, quarterly reporting. Thank God they haven't even got out their report, just getting them out now in October for their fiscal years, which will always end on June 30th academic year, and uh, they're just getting the data out now, and it doesn't look so good for last year. I think it's probably going to be about a 0% return for the college endowment funds, and a combined, and it, you know, it's so hard to deal with. My poor aging brain uh, has a great deal of trouble going from college fiscal years to calendar years. So when I tell you what the return on a bond stock portfolio, say Wellington Fund or Balanced Index Fund, was in the year end of June 30th, I frankly had no idea what that 0% compare with. Well, it turns out to be about 6% is the average for a 60-40 index endowment one last year, roughly that. Uh, so the colleges aren't going to come up to that. And they, the, the disadvantages 
I'm giving you the advantage of them to, you know, they, and they have terrific research guys, and they're, they're all over the world, and they're innovative, they understand some of these complex instruments that the rest of us really don't have a fighting chance, speaking only for myself, don't have a fighting chance of understanding, so that they're, they're good. Uh, but uh, what gets in their way now, well, they've, been, they've been doing that for quite a few years, it's basically the Swenson model. They do it at Princeton. Princeton is right up there with, with, uh, with Yale. I very, very, I, I kind of wonder why this is so, but very similar uh, returns year after year. In the last 10 or 15 years, I think Yale is about, I don't know, 20 basis, 20 basis points ahead. Let me say 12% a year compared to 12.2, something like that now. And uh, so that they're terrific long-term records. But what happens in the market is other people copy you. And uh, you know, the market gets more efficient. Uh, there's a lot more price discovery and high, treated, uh, high frequency trading has a lot to do with that, making the markets more efficient. And when there's nobody playing your game, as it was when uh, A.W. Jones started the first hedge fund in, I think, 1950 or 60, uh, you know, he could do he a good idea when everybody does it. All hedge fund managers cannot, will not, and are not above average. Uh, they're all average. And then you take out 20%, 2%, 20% of the gains, and 2% you're talking probably 4 or 5% a year. Nobody can overcome that in the long run. So it's costs are a big negative. Uh, efficiency, the relative efficiency of the markets is a big negative. Uh, people are just getting wise to the fact that these private equity things and hedge funds are great compensation devices for managers and private equity. I won't mention the name of a certain firm who's, uh, um, who's uh, president is running for president of the United States. You better watch that. Nelson Nelson Nelson's holstering up his dollars. But they rip people off. They borrow all this money, over leverage the thing, and they pay it to themselves. Uh, and uh, it's pretty, pretty seamy stuff. And I tell everybody to avoid it unless you're sure you can pick the right hedge fund manager, whatever it is. So when everybody's looking for, let's say, acres of diamonds in their own backyard, uh, the, uh, you know, there's only one diamond there. And so the price of it goes up and up as people discover that. So it's competition. These guys, the, the general run of people that are running these hedge funds and these quants is brilliance. I mean, they are fantastic. Uh, some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And if I was to draw a little scale here, uh, I would put my intelligence at the baseboard level over there, and theirs right at that top ceiling level. I mean, there's a big gap there. But when everybody is doing it, they can't all win. This is not complicated. And this is not Lake, Lake Wobegon either. <laughs> there's, there's only so much alpha out there. My, my operating principle is something that's called Rakenthaler's Rule, which is named after John Rakenthaler, who works at Vanguard. He works at Morningstar. <laughs> Slip the lip. Yeah, right. right. He, wishes, he wishes, I guess. And, and Rakenthaler's Rule for 20 years has been if the bozos know about it, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and, and I see the bozos now investing in the Yale model. Uh, you know, we see people coming to us at our firm saying, gosh, we just got shown this by this big investment company, that big investment company, and it's the Yale model. It's one half stocks and bonds, conventional, and one half alternatives. And what's alternatives? Well, it's hedge funds and private real estate. And Timber, my own commodity. Yeah. I, I, I love Timber. I worked for 30 years in a place uh, that, uh, that, uh, that produced nothing but Timber. And what's happening in, in that area in, in, in rural Oregon is these old families who've been in the business who certainly know how to value their cash flow, who sent their sons to Wharton, uh, are now selling out to people who. Uh, uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, who have smooth hands. Uh, where do you think the information asymmetry is there? Okay, I mean, if you don't know your way around a 50-inch chainsaw and a choker cable, you probably shouldn't be working in the forest or investing in forest products. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, the Yale model is the conventional wisdom now. There's a wonderful section in, in David Swenson's book where he says, if you're invention, investing, in the conventional wisdom, you will have your head handed to you. Well, he's the conventional wisdom now. 
and you know, I, I have to believe he's a smart enough man that he's doing something good right now. Well, let me uh, put a little icing on that cake by saying, <coughs> Warren Buffett's phrase, all new ideas go through these three phases. First, the innovator. Second, the imitator. Third, the idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so I warned investors not to be the idiots. <laughs> another, another great innovator was John Templeton. Uh, John Templeton, of course, invested in foreign stocks, particularly Japanese stocks, back in the late 40s when you couldn't even take those stocks out of the country. Uh, a brilliant, uh, incisive uh, man. Uh, and, you know, when he saw people piling into Japanese stocks, starting to do so in the late 70s, he sold out to the, uh, to the, to the, to the U.S. market. And so the, the most important word in the title of, of uh, David Swenson's book, Pioneering Portfolio Management, it's not portfolio management, pioneering is the most important word. If you're not a pioneer and you're not first, uh, you're probably in, in the wrong game. That's, that's something a lot of people don't, don't realize. And the other thing you know, is that I think we all know, I mean, if these guys can't get it right, uh, if, if all the college endowments, and I see Rick Ferry sitting down at the back, he wrote a marvelous article for, for Forbes about this very subject. If they're not getting it right, what odds does the average client of you know, J.P. Morgan Stanley have who's being put into all these, these private uh, investments? Not, not very good, I would suggest. Um, the crisis. We're now four years. I, I remember you talking about the Lehman Index uh, at this conference in, um, in, in September of uh, 19, 2008. I think it was in San Diego. And just about when you use the word Lehman Index, you just about shriek the word Lehman. Um, we now have four years' perspective on this, Jack. Uh, you know, and we've seen how things have gone down. Uh, do you think that we got out of that as well as we could have out of it? And the segue, the follow-up to that question is, if you had been Hank Paulson, if you had had his position uh, in on September 16, 2008, knowing what we did now, would you have done things differently? What would you have done? Well, uh, let me say, answering the first part of the question, that you know when you're confronted with a possible financial catastrophe, which is what we were confronted with, because that system is so overlinked, so overleveraged, and so misaligned in terms of its incentives that we just got totally out of whack, and it should have been easy to see. I, unfortunately, did not see as much of it as I should. If I had spent a week on the West Coast with a countrywide mortgage salesman, I would have come back and said, out. Because you could see the way those things were building up. I don't follow the mortgage companies, Washington Mutual, and so on, never have. Uh, but I had no idea how much out of hand uh, their lending had gotten. But it's so, I guess, really obvious uh, that when you've got a bunch of salesmen trying to give you a $250,000 mortgage for a $150,000 house, and you've got a hundred. $100,000 left over to your set yourself, and that's that's what happens, or what did happen in some cases. And in some cases, the people are making $30,000 a year. Some story about a grape picker that was making $16,000 a year, and he bought a $200,000 house. That's got to end badly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, and then you break the link between borrower and seller, mm -hmm. and that's what happened in the mortgage business. The banks would take those mortgages, make their fees to mortgage banks, sell them to banks who didn't care. They probably didn't even look at them because they were going to sell them to some kind of a, a new underwriting of mortgage-backed security, securitization. Mm -hmm. So the risk holders were completely two, two levels removed from the risk takers and the homeowners back there who, who have been borrowed, who have borrowed the money. And that just... It's only a question of when. And you know, maybe I was just not alert enough, and I really feel pretty stupid about it personally, because I didn't think it would amount to that much. But if I'd known how much it was going on, you know, you would have been alarmed immediately. Just seeing what happens on the ground, and uh, a lot of us are a little more elevated than we should be from the real world existence, and you don't get in the ground, I don't nearly enough. And that's not my business anyway, but it was such a big thing 
but somebody should have been looking at it somewhere. I think Bill Gross might have been looking at it, had some people doing exactly the same, same thing. See what's actually happening. I mean, it's really important. Don't take anybody else's word for anything. So the crisis was going to come, and it was going to be terrible. And I think, uh, what would I have done if I were Hank Paulson? I think I, I just would have uh, tried to do a more comprehensive job. And I thought he was, say to somebody, I thought he was a little bit punch drunk, because it was a punch here, and then a few days later a punch there, and then another punch. Uh, and you know, I, I, I'm not sure that uh, the greatest credentials for a Treasury Secretary is to be an investment banker. He's a very, very, very good guy, very smart guy, and a very strong guy. And without the strength, you know, not much is going to happen. So I commend him for all that, but I still think we could have done a better job. Uh, we finally get the so-called TARP, which was to buy bad assets. And TARP never did buy any bad assets. It was so funny, we call the thing TARP, which is something blah, blah, about uh, getting the bad assets out of the banks, buying, buying them back from them. And that hasn't happened. What, what happened? A whole lot of other very different things that TARP money was used for. So, uh, and that probably had to be used there. I think I would have done more. I'm more of a Keynesian than ever, and uh, not perfectly, because none of those things work perfectly. But I would have done, if I had, you know, if I was the king, um, two or three steps, and say at least two or three trillion steps from the throne, uh, done more stimulation, more stimulation in the you know, infrastructure side, uh, where we you know, put people back to work, and that we may yet have to do that or try and do it. Because the greatest price an economy pays for all this, ultimately, is the lack of full utilization of its productive power. Uh, people are out of work. So, uh, I, you know, and I think Ben Bernanke was, was very good. Uh, I'm not sure what Hank would have amounted to without Ben Bernanke to sign, because Ben Bernanke, naturally, he was a Princeton professor, is extremely smart. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And, uh, so, uh, and I think he's doing what he can, but he's trying to do the impossible. And that is, he's trying to, to, to solve this problem with monetary policy, with the money supply, yeah. with buying securities, with QE2, which I always thought was an ocean liner. And, <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, I forget what the other one, the, new, the newest one is called. Twist, Operation Twist. Getting out of the short term securities of that and buying long term securities. Uh, and uh, monetary policy, I mean, sorry, fiscal policy, monetary policy can only do so much. And that's one of the big things behind the blow up in Europe. The idea of, of monetary policy is uh, basically European wide, because it's based on the market. But the idea of fiscal policy is each government's responsibility. I mean, you separate those two. And we sure have to separate it here just because of the nature of our system. You know, the government's in charge of both, finally. Uh, but the legislative side is just so stymied, uh, on, and unable to do almost anything. I'll give you an example to show you how dumb it's gotten. Uh, but um, so I hope that's not too political. Uh, but um, uh, we aren't doing, we're trying to have monetary policy carry the burden. And you can't. Monetary policy cannot, unequivocally, cannot do it all. So we've got to do some fiscal stuff. And God alone knows what's going to come out of this so-called fiscal cliff. Uh, you know, it's not going to go on the way it is for sure because it just can't be sustained. But it is uh, horrifying to me. This is a not a politically slanted conversation, but this deadlock between the parties means no material legislation can get done in Washington D.C. And the only thing, the only piece of legislation the two sides have been able to agree on is probably the worst piece of securities legislation ever designed by the mind of man. And that is the so-called Jobs Act. Put jobs in it if you want to get it passed. And it's supposed to increase jobs by giving small businesses access to public capital. So all the constraints on very small companies going public, uh, prospectuses, all that kind of thing, all those are, are taken down, limited. Uh, and it's much easier to raise capital out there. But there are a lot of swindlers out there. And they are going to come and swindle an awful lot of people before this is over. So we get the Jobs Act. Both parties think it's wonderful. And it's going to have to be repealed one day. Because it may, it may be, and as far as I know, it hasn't created one job. Uh, but uh, it's just a symbol of something that really lies at the root of many of the problems we're dealing with in this country. 
and that is a political system that is, you know, in chaos, uh, unable to move, and oftentimes it's a good idea for the Congress to do nothing. I mean, you could say one of the great blessings is Congress can't act, and there is something to that, uh, but not under these circumstances. So we'll have to see what comes out of the election, uh, see if sides can somehow reason together and, and, and produce what's best for the country instead of what's best for their own individual interest. I know that's idealistic, and I hope it's not too political for Mel for me to approach that subject. Uh -huh. and, my, my favorite economist of all time is Hyman Minsky, who wrote about the instability inherent in our financial system, and it touches on exactly what Jack was talking about, which is that if your primary instrument is monetary policy, then what you do is you get into the cycle where you stimulate Wall Street, but you don't stimulate Main Street, which is what Ben Bernanke is doing. There's been a lot of stimulation of Wall Street. Stocks have been on a tear. All of the assets have been on a tear. Uh, but it hasn't done a great deal, it's done something, but not a great deal for the economy. If you want to do that, you have to do it on the fiscal side. And so you wind up with a, it, it was more of a map, but you wind up with this very unstable political system, fiscal system where you just get financial boom uh, and, and bust. And that, that does, of all the things that frighten me, that, that, that frightens me the most is, is this chronic instability we have. Financial system. We went. We started out with four banks that were too big to fail. Now we've got three that are big. And I, I think it's a very frightening uh, situation. It's why I've always, you know, believed from the portfolio side that you want to separate out your risky and your riskless assets. You know, uh, and stay away from things that are in the middle, like, like corporate bonds and junk bonds and the most part things like that. Unless you're getting paid a very reasonable risk. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting. Premium. It's an interesting example of congressional failure, I think, in that hey, we've got the Dodd-Frank Act, and they've got all these, I think, 194 regulations that were going down there. All to do what they could have done with one stroke of the pen by saying, quote, bring back class Steagall Act. Mm -hmm. what about that? Yeah. <laughs> about the soul of capitalism in 2005. And, uh, all we do is say, I mean, it seems so simple to me. You're, you can be in the deposit-taking business, or you can be in the investment banking business, but you can't be in both. We'll call it the mobile law. <laughs> Another question that's completely, uh, again, uh, off of what we were talking about before, but I think it's important to this group, which is, what do you see as the long-term function of this organization of, of, of the nine parties? like we see this doing 10 or 20 years from now? Well, first of all, I think it's unbelievable how it has burgeoned. And uh, I think it's quite remarkable uh, what wonderful people you guys all are trying to help others. It's good human beings, the backbone of America. You forget that in too many places. And uh, people are doing all the nation's hard work. And we're trying to be intelligent investors in a market that is just the opposite of intelligent. So um, I feel very good about the message. It cannot be the wrong message. Find another mutual fund manager in America who says, if you do what I tell you, it, you can't go wrong. There's no way to say that. I think Peter Lynch, uh, he was great in 1992. He left the Magellan Fund and it's dropped, I'm going to mention this later on, from $105 billion to around $9 billion. That's a lot of disappointment for investors. Very mediocre, actually worse than mediocre. Uh, so to the extent people are looking, and people are looking all over the country for unbiased financial advice, investment advice particularly, and uh, you find it in the actual owners. I mean, there's nothing any better than that the owner of a product, car, or service uh, say, I've done this, and it works. And so I see this thing spreading. Uh, like an infectious disease, if you will. <laughs> and pretty soon everybody's going to be affected with it. So I see you getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, I don't know the logistics of putting together your site. Uh, and I think, you know, you, 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 I mean, I see some of the stuff. And uh, Mike Nolan, my assistant, sees some of it and gives it to me. I imagine we have some full time person at Vanguard who sees it. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that the management tries to respond when they see something significant. You know, poor law, law and state and that kind of thing. And uh, I still get letters from shareholders asking me to correct these things. I can't do that. 
but I, but I answer them and send them to someone at the bank or he will, or at least is supposed to. And uh, so, I mean, I think it's an idea, an independent body of self-educated investors who have learned the right thing uh, in an industry that's going the wrong way. So, next year we should hire Madison Square Garden. <laughs> well, that, that leads to just one of very fast questions from one or two people in the audience. Susan is, I don't know if Alex is around, what's happening to website traffic? I, it's, I haven't, I haven't ever really done the numbers, but uh, I mean there's lulls in activity and then I, I can't answer that uh, overall, but I think, I think it's increased, the, the increase is also in the wiki side. Because I, I think, uh, but not only from traffic, but I, I get a, I'm getting a lot of comments here from people who don't have aren't forum members, and they're saying thank you. So it's not just the web traffic; it's the people who are reading the forum and not. I mean, if you look at the stats of the views of a the, the views of a topic and how many people post, you might have 10 posts, but 100 views. That means I'm helping 100 people, not the 10 who post in there. So uh, a lot of the uh, education I try to give is for those people, not just answering the question directly. Because what, did you all hear that answer? Okay, basically, uh, what Susan said, that's Lady Geek, uh, what, what Susan said was that she's not sure about website traffic. A lot of people are, are lurking, basically, uh, and not posting. Uh, and then the wiki is also getting a lot of traffic. But Jack's comment, I think, is well taken, which is that maybe the most useful thing we do is the website. There's a lot of good that goes on on that website. Uh, it's, it's very high level. I'm very proud of it. Uh, and, uh, and I think we are helping a lot of people. And maybe, just maybe in this era, that is really where the action's going to be. I don't know. But I think it's something that's worth, worth looking at. Uh, finally, one more question on that. Well, let me just add one little thing to that, if I may. And, and I was asked to write the introduction to uh, Boglehead Guide to Investing. And I, had, I came up with a quote from him, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, Democracy in America. And he talked about, and I have the quote from the book, uh, about the tendency of Americans in, in the year 1818 or something a long time ago, the tendency of Americans to gather together to work on issues and to fix them. And uh, this is obviously, if to Tocqueville were around today, he would say, man, did I hit that one right out of the park. <laughs> of course, you know, Robert Putnam has written a counterpoint to that. He says that we're not doing it as much, but this may be the answer to that. He's willing to admit that. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Robert Putnam's there in the whole in the room, of course. And the loss, that's the loss of social capital in the United States. Um, finally, one last question, and then I'll get out of your way. Jack, I've never been able to convince you to uh, think about, or other people, I haven't really been trying to do it, but I know other people, not, not convince about gold because it doesn't produce a, uh, a dividend, it's just a new asset, it's not productive. So we can't convince you about that as a standalone asset. We can't probably convince you even in terms of portfolio theory. What about insurance? Okay, we're looking at uh, uh, a, uh, an environment in which we don't know what is going to be happening to the inflation supply of money? Uh, 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 and, and the inflation rate with money supply and the velocity of money. If someone came to you and said, Look, I just want to own a few gold coins uh, as insurance, I'm going to buy them, and I hope they do them. What do I use them? I'd say, Be my guest. Uh, we live in a totally uncertain world, and if you believe in likelihood that gold would be a good performing asset in a bad performing world, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to manage your portfolio as a diversifier. Uh, now, at 5% probably is not a bad working number to give you my opinion, and recognizing that it's strictly a supply and demand equation. When you buy it, you get no return on your money. You buy it with the hope you can sell it, if you ever do, for a larger amount of money than you paid for it. And so it's just another commodity with this peculiar almost universal use since the beginning of time. And uh, so I wouldn't try and talk anybody out of it. I don't have to do it with my personal accounts at all. Uh, but uh, I would think about it in a long-term account just because we don't know uh, what's coming along. And there is the possibility of, you know, always the possibility of kind of a black swan event. And uh, that would be a health 
whole diversifier. And unfortunately, one of the things, Bill, you know this, is that um, whenever somebody comes up with a diversifier, they do someone with a hot performing asset, well, gold in this case, it says a great diversifier, it's usually at an all time high. <laughs> and no one called gold a great diversifier 15 years ago. Forbes called it a great diversifier, I don't know, maybe in 1960. Uh, and then they forgot about it because it didn't perform well. So, you know, it either is a great diversifier or it isn't. But there's a huge tendency of our financial markets to rely on, or our, our financial promoters, to rely on, you know, they, they, they know you want to just kind of secretly watch that price of gold and it goes up and you want it. So they try and intellectually justify it by saying it's a diversifier. So I'd say do gold, but do it in very small accounts if you do it at all, and with great caution. This is the riskiest time, most difficult time to invest, I know. And uh, not so much the risk, but the terrible returns, I'll talk about this a little bit later, the terrible returns on bonds, the, the customary and then inevitably the customary and diversifier for an equity portfolio. Yeah, you know, there's the famous Eagles song, The Last Resort, with a great line in it, call someplace paradise, kiss it goodbye. And I think that's the basic story of all. Diversifying asset classes. Well, with that, I will thank you, Jack, and get out of your way.